So, so in Kosovo, opponents of humanitarian intervention argue, well, look at what's happened. Actually, the KLA has effectively been brought to power by NATO. And what did they do once in power? They basically did carry out ethnic cleansing of not only the Serb civilian population, but the Jewish population of, of Kosovo and the, and the Roma gypsy population as well. Um, furthermore, they've been, in, they've been involved in uh, major pan-European organized crime networks, members of the KLA, the UN have reported on this, um, involved in uh, leading politicians from the KLA who took over Kosovo thanks to NATO's intervention, been involved in organ trafficking, um, drug trafficking, uh, <clears throat> prostitution rackets. So effectively, it can be the case of Kosovo, you could argue that Kosovo has been turned into a kind of gangster state run by organized criminals along the lines of, the, the, uh, uh, of a kind of mafia. Um, as a result of the um, intervention there. And these they've not only used their power to, to continue with their organized crime, but they've also carried out ethnic cleansings of their own. So that arguably that um, intervention did more harm than good in terms of judging by its effects. Libya, a similar case can be made, um, a much more uh, unambiguous case of harm being caused in Libya. If you look at Libya today, it's become a classic example of what's called a failed state, where there's no um, government able to effectively control the whole country. Um, again, as with Kosovo, it led to ethnic cleansing. Um, the rebels who were brought to power by NATO um, uh, conducted uh, ethnic cleansing of an entire black Libyan city called Tawerga, which has now been turned into a ghost town. Um, you've seen uh, the rise of ISIS in Libya as a result of the power vacuum left by the intervention. Um, there's a civil war that's ongoing to this day in Libya. Um, you've seen, as a result of it being a failed state, uh, different so-called terror groups, or, or I prefer to call them sectarian militias, due to the whole controversial nature of the term terrorism. But the whole region's kind of armed gangs and sectarian militias flooded into Libya to set up training camps there, to help themselves to the weapons that have become freely available in Libya as a result of the intervention. Um, and the capacity of groups in the region, like Nigeria's Boko Haram, um, like Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, all of these groups have been uh, had their capacity massively boosted by the by the intervention in Libya. Had a huge access to arms as a result, access to training camps. Um, the ma the major terrorist attacks in North Africa and Europe that have carried out been carried out since then. Many many of them have been carried out by people who trained in Libya in camps set up as a result of the intervention. Um, the British tourists killed in Sousse in Tunisia a couple of years ago um, were killed by uh, someone who got his training in a, a camp in Libya. Um, uh, Salman Abidi, the Manchester bomber, uh, who struck in Manchester in, in uh, 20, 2017, wasn't it? Um, he trained in Libya. He was part of the, the, the NATO effort, actually, to overthrow Gaddafi. Um, so if we tie these examples together, we can see that we can argue that, um, that these kind of consequences are actually an inevitable result, arguably, of going into a country and destroying its system of government. Because what you do is you create a power vacuum and eventually a failed state. And into that vacuum, you get different militias fighting it out with each other, create civil wars, different armed groups, criminal gangs, terror groups, etc., um, using the country as a base and so on. Um, and, and obviously, all of this, it can be seen, it can be argued, does more harm than good. So actually you're not saving lives by such intervention. You're costing lives. A second argument against intervention is that it, it actually clashes with the key principles of international law that have been developed over centuries. Most obviously, I'll go into three principles that are undermined by humanitarian intervention. Most obviously, is the most obvious one is state sovereignty. And this has been it is argued the key pillar of international law since 1648. I always have to point out this it was never accepted by the European powers. They never respected the sovereignty of non-European states who they colonized at will. Nevertheless, um, it's considered to have been a, a kind of key pillar of international law since 1648. Um, the 1648 was the Treaty of Westphalia that ended the European wars of religion with by establishing this principle that 
what each state does in its own territory is its own business. No one else has the right to intervene. Um, and this has been a key argument of Russia against Western intervention in Syria. Syria is a sovereign state, and therefore under international law, it has the right to determine its own affairs. No one else has the right to intervene. Um, a second key principle of international law that's undermined by humanitarian intervention is, and it's linked to state sovereignty, is the idea of national self-determination, the right to self-determination, the right of each nation to determine its own future. Now, this is a hard-won right, especially by the colonized nations of the world. Um, it really became globally accepted, I'd say, in the 1960s. Um, uh, when these so-called third generation solidarity rights emerged, brought forward to the UN by uh, the, the, the newly independent states of the global south. And in a, in a way, you can humanitarian intervention kind of reverses the clock, turns the clock back to a time before the right of self-determination was accepted for the peoples of the world. It takes us back to the era when mostly white European and North American states can attack and invade the mostly non-white, non-European states at will. Um, so to many crit critics of humanitarian intervention, this smacks of neo-colonialism and indeed racism. Um, and we shouldn't forget that actually colonialism itself in its original form has always been justified using humanitarian rhetoric. So when the British went into India, they justified it on the grounds that they were there to end barbaric practices of sati, widow burning and so on. Uh, when the British went into Africa and colonized Africa in the 19th century, they said they were doing it to end the slave trade. So for many non-European nations, the use of humanitarian rhetoric to justify war and invasions against them has a long and sordid history. Um, a third principle of international law that is undermined by humanitarian intervention is the principle of last resort. There's, again, it's been a long-standing principle of international law that war is only ever supposed to be used as an absolute last resort. In other words, when all other uh, means of resolving a dispute or resolving a conflict have been exhausted. But supporters of humanitarian intervention always make this uh, claim of urgency, demanding that action be taken right now. So let me give you an example. David Cameron in 2011 rejected out of hand offers by the Gaddafi government to negotiate um, with the rebels. He argued, look, the Libyan army is at the gates of Benghazi right now. If we don't stop Gaddafi now, it will be too late. So there's this sense of urgency that comes with calls for humanitarian intervention. There's no time for talks, no time for negotiation. We've got to, we've got to take action right now. People are dying right now. Um, so uh, so, th where's the, so then the, this, this principle of last resort is greatly undermined by uh, humanitarian intervention. So if we take these these three key pillars of international law, really, um, uh, a, 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 as one, and see how they're all undermined by humanitarian intervention, then opponents would argue, well, nothing will be left of international law, actually, if these principles are torn up. It will be a free-for-all in which the most powerful states can attack their enemies at will using spurious human rights arguments as justification. And indeed, opponents of intervention argue this is exactly what does actually happen right now. That's what happened with Kosovo, that's what happened with Iraq, that's what happened with Libya, and so on. Um, I'll pause there, move on to our next video.